Community Media Center, and uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, Community Media Center's mission is to build community through media. So one of the ways we do that is by putting on these lecture series of trying to bring in folks who not only thinking and writing about interesting stuff, but also doing interesting work. Uh, uh, these may not be household names, but uh, we think that what um, speakers like Stan are doing uh, are bringing in a very important, fresh perspective to issues that uh, most of us are concerned about. Uh, before I introduce them, I just want to, you know, let people know about upcoming events we have here. Um, if you're not on the Wealthy Theater mailing list, there's a sign up in the lobby for you to do so, uh, to get a once a week email or once a month mailer. But we have uh, documentaries coming up. We have uh, Howard Lyman, former rancher turned vegetarian, a guy who got Oprah Winfrey sued for a million dollars for saying she wouldn't eat hamburgers ever again. Um, he's going to be here April 3rd uh, with a documentary called Peaceful Kingdom. Uh, on the 12th and 13th of April, we're showing a documentary about Robert S. Williams and his wife Mabel called Niggers with Guns. And it's an interesting look at NAACP chapter in the Carolinas that decided to uh, defend themselves after their members were being lynched. Um, systematically. Uh, there's a lot of other events. There's Earth Day film here, a documentary called Thirst, which looks at the privatization of water around the world as well as in Michigan. Uh, it's an issue that we should all be, you know, paying attention to seriously. Uh, and, and then just ongoing programs, documentaries, and if you haven't had a chance to see it yet for the rest of this month, you should try to come see Why We Fight, Eugene Jarecki's documentary that looks at the military industrial complex. Very well done. Uh, and in fact, it's a great compliment to complimentary sort of piece to what Stan is going to speak about tonight. Uh, for those of you who are interested in, in getting involved in stuff related to the topic this evening, uh, before you leave in the lobby, uh, Randy Flood is here with the Men's Resource Center, uh, you know, doing gender justice work. So check out his resources and the work they're doing. He has a book uh, with his uh, co uh, conspirator, uh, Charlie, uh, coming out in a few weeks. Um, there's also uh, material uh, from a recently developed 9-11 Truth sort of chapter in West Michigan. They have some films they're going to be showing here in April as well. And if people aren't aware of the local cost of the war campaign, uh, there's flyers out there. But on April 11th, we're going to be hoping to fill City Hall with people talking about how we don't want another dime going to Iraq. We want it to stay in our communities for things like health and education uh, and protecting the environment. This is the fifth in the Meeting Democracy series we've been doing. And um, I first uh, read Stan's sort of autobiographical piece uh, about his time in, in Haiti when he was in the military called Hidden Dreams. And, uh, and then his subsequent book that came out after 9-11. And apart from the fact that he has a, a, a long history in the military, um, his analysis of what's going on uh, on all kinds of levels, both politically, militarily, and economically, I think is fresh and important. And uh, it's not the kind of discourse we're hearing, by and large, uh, every day in any of the, certainly, corporate-owned media. But even in, in sort of, I think, in many ways, even traditional sort of progressive or left circles. Uh, so it caught our eye right away. And, uh, and then when we read, he was writing a new book out called Sex and War, which is actually a little bit delayed, and he can talk about that. Um, but to just have a conversation again, uh, somebody to sort of look at those intersections of militarism and sexism, uh, we thought also an important thing, particularly coming from a white guy, and a white guy who used to be in the military. So. Um, We've been hanging out all day. He's been speaking out of Grand Valley and at Aquinas. And uh, uh, I'm not going to really say much more other than just that the couple things that he said today that really sort of st stuck with me is that he thinks that in some ways uh, 
ex-military people are the are potentially the best revolutionaries as well as the best political scientists. So with that, please join me in welcoming Stan Goff. <laughs> I want to thank Jeff and I want to thank everybody who came and, and um, for this opportunity and uh, I'm still sort of overwhelmed by this facility. I, I want one of these. <laughs> <laughs> this is really nice. Um, I'm not even sure what to call it because there's so many different components to it over here. And um, Jeff just set me up with that comment about revolutionaries and now I've got to convince everybody that I'm not frothing at the mouth over here. Um, but uh, I mean that's 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 apparently one of the questions that I uh, run into is you know you know what happened to you yeah. um, because ours is sort of the expectation I think it's because it's sort of a popular um, you know dramatic convention that someone has an epiphany you know and then they have this um, overwhelming transformative change in their lives and so the expectation is that that's what happened that I had some sort of an epiphany that I was struck blind on the road to Damascus, and it wasn't anything like that at all. Um, actually, the, uh, the military, and that's why I say that military people or ex-military people can make extremely good political scientists is because um, we, don't, we don't experience politics as an abstraction. Uh, you know, we experience it uh, right there where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, uh, because politics is about power and we end up being the instruments of the projection of physical brute power. Um, and in particularly in, a, in a, um, an imperial society like the one that we're living in right now, uh, we find ourselves projecting that power outside our own country. That's, that's unique, that's a unique uh, circumstance for most soldiers. Most soldiers in most nations uh, never leave their own countries. They are actually there, uh, at least ostensibly for defense, they've named our War Department, the Department of Defense, as a joke, I suppose. Um, but there's nothing about it <laughs> that's defensive. In fact, there's no one in the world today that offers a credible military threat to the United States. No one. Um, unless someone expects, I don't know, an attack from Canada or Jamaican frog men or something, because there's really, nobody has the capacity. It's just not that way. Now, 9-11 was a military strike. It was a military strike against the United States, and they were actually very strategic targets. There was a financial target, there was a, uh, there was a, a, a military target, there was a political target. Uh, but this was an asymmetric strike, and it's one against which the most powerful military in the world had no capacity to prevent it. That's what we have to understand. You can spend all the money you want on the military. You can't prevent something like that from happening. And they can't prevent the next time either. The only way that you prevent that is quit provoking people with your foreign policy. If you quit provoking people, then they won't be compelled to do that. That wasn't done because someone is evil or because they hated freedom. You know, that's, that's really the culmination, however perverse and however awful and however execrable in its execution, it was still the culmination of a set of very provocative and oppressive foreign policies in another part of the world. And our support for other people's provocative and excessive policies in other parts of the world, in particular the state of Israel. You know, we have to be clear about this. Um, if you quit provoking people, then people aren't going to take that kind of trouble to attack us. They have no reason to. Um, Iraq was never a threat to the United States. There is, again, there's no credible military threat to the United States. But the United States can't dispense with its military. We can't dispense with the military because it's so intimately articulated into every aspect of our economy, even our domestic economy. Uh, you know, if you, we did an exercise in one of the schools I spoke at this morning, or this, uh, early this afternoon, just look at the tags on the backs of your shirts back there, and you can come up with basically a sort of a geography lesson of the entire globe. They're made everywhere except in the United States, where, um, you know, we, we, we run the world through an economic system and the military is an enforcement arm of that. Um, and, and, and consequently, the way that we run it right now is that we make dollars and everybody else makes things to get dollars and consequently they export to us. And we have this huge, everybody knows about the trade deficit, we import much more than we export. So what we've developed is something that even back in the Reagan administration people called military Keynesianism, which is demand production. 
using the military as a surrogate uh, export market for manufactured goods. And a good deal of the industrial economy that's left inside the United States right now is attached in one way or another to the defense industry, or to the, to the military industrial complex. So if, if you have a society that runs itself economically with war production, it's only a matter of time until you have to employ that war production for something in order to justify it. A lot of people making a lot of money right now. You know, anybody that's making a Tomahawk cruise missile is making a lot of money right now. Because the more of them we shoot up, anybody that's making a 7.62 ball ammunition right now is making a lot of money. Because the more of it we shoot up, the more of it they have to manufacture, the more money they make. But that's not the only reason that they do that. This is sort of tangential to the, to the real problem, what's going on right now. The, the, oh, there it is. It says, uh, is the US, is the US military liberating Iraq? And I mean, you know, it's obviously that's a rhetorical question. <clears throat> um, I mean, let's think about that. Because, you know, a lot of people think that there is something to do with liberation going on. Even a lot of people who have now come to question or even oppose the war have still not questioned some of the assumptions about the war, that there was, you know, that we went over there because we had bad information, and, you know, that we really meant to do the right thing, but we're doing it incompetently or, you know, or whatever. And, uh, you know, I, th I think we have to take this question of liberation and sort of unpack it a little bit uh, to make sense of how we respond to, to this rhetorical question up here. Um, liberation does not equal individual liberty. You know, liberation is a national kind of thing. In, in this context, we're talking about a national phenomenon. And it doesn't relate so much to individual liberties as we have them codified uh, in the Bill of Rights and things like that. Which, by the way, if you really start looking at that closely, what it does is it, it uh, this is a, a, a thing that grants certain abstract liberties to preserve certain concrete powers. Uh, but I'm not going to get into that right now. We'll do a critique of liberal law at some other point. My point here is that liberation, when we talk about liberation, we're not talking about individual liberties. But see, this conflation of the idea that, you know, somehow, you know, all of a sudden Laura Bush became a feminist whenever we started dropping bombs on Afghanistan. It's a, you know, so they've twisted things up in a way that conflates this notion of individual liberties with, with liberation. When we talk about liberation in the national context, we have to talk about questions of independence. You know, of independence. We have to talk about questions of self-determination, about the ability of a nation and a people to participate uh, in, in the construction of their own history. And we just look at our own history. All we have to just look at our own history. You know, we've, we've got, the, of course, the official mythology, but I'm sure a good number of people in here are also familiar with the actual history of the United States. And it's, it's not one that conforms well to the sort of mythology that we were out there, you know, trying to secure freedom for ourselves and the rest of the world. In fact, uh, you know, what we did was we, we, we wanted we, the rhetorical we, it was really, you know, we weren't alive yet. It was uh, you know, our predecessors uh, nationally and not even all of our predecessors um, in the United States uh, did no longer wanted to pay tribute to a feudal monarch on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. They wanted to make money on their own, in their own way, here, and control their own trade relations was the essence of the reason that we sought our independence in this country. And in fact, we didn't seek independence for a lot of people. We didn't seek independence for people that didn't own property. We didn't seek independence or self-determination for black people. We didn't seek independence or self-determination for women. That's not just... Uh, an anomalous situation. This was the structure, and in many respects, it's still the structure. It's just been, it's been uh, sort of reconfigured uh, in the face of popular struggles uh, to add ourselves as uh, those of us who are women, those of us who are black, those of us uh, who do not own property. There were actual social struggles that went forward and forced. Uh, the elites in this country to accept that we were part of, uh, of, uh, of the body politic, that we were actually entitled to citizenship. Uh, that didn't happen by accident. Um, and what's really important to understand in the context of talking about Iraq is to settle, to settle one social question in this country. Uh, in the mid-19th century, we fought what was at the time the bloodiest civil war, the bloodiest war in human history. 
At the time it was fought, the American Civil War was the bloodiest war that had ever been fought in human history. You know, so we had, we had to go through that kind of pain and national trauma just to settle one, one political question, and that was the question of slavery. Um, so the idea that this, that this has to be somehow um, palatable and clean and easy is does not conform to the history of human societies, and it won't conform to that history in other places either. Uh, you know, Iraq uh, was an artificial entity. It was an outgrowth of a British mandate in the British Empire. The British Empire made this entity called Iraq, drew a line around it and said that this was a nation, then administered that nation. Now, at, with the rise of pan-Arab nationalism, secular nationalism, by the way, they, they, they managed to eventually, in the struggle against uh, colonial oversight, uh, to forge out a national identity that now exists as Iraqis. And that's one reason that they're so tenaciously resisting uh, the imposition of a U.S. military occupation right now. Um, so, you know, there is only one, and if we, if we look at this as a question of self-determination, the expulsion of foreign forces is the first and primary and most necessary step uh, for the liberation of Iraq, regardless of how painful and traumatic that participation in their own history will be after we leave. And we will leave. We will leave. Let there be no doubt about it. We will lose the war in Iraq. We have, in many respects, lost it already. And I don't mean we in this room. We're not out there, you know, we're not out there launching weapons at anyone ourselves, but uh, we're signing the checks for it. So, um, But someone, someone asked me um, earlier today, and, and this, this question is out there um, about whenever we say things. I'm part of a campaign of military families speak out, and Veterans for Peace, Iraq Veterans Against the War, Gold Star Families for Peace, and some others, um, called Bring Them Home Now. Um, it's a national campaign. It's been going on for a long time. And in fact, uh, we've been very successful at getting large national anti-war organizations to adopt that as a sort of slogan, as a sort of, um, you know, uh, thematic centerpiece uh, for the campaign against the war. And that word now was very controversial, bring them home now, you know. And so people say, well, how do we, how do we get out of Iraq? How do we get out of Iraq? And, and, and the answer, and it's not to be flip, is the same answer that someone gave whenever they asked the same question about Vietnam. How do we get out of Iraq? We get out with ships and airplanes. That's how we get out. We get out now. You know, and it doesn't take, you know, uh, all this sort of machinations in the background of these different political actors right now saying we've got to come up with, you know, we've got to, uh, we've got to have a democratic uh, exit strategy as a counterpoint to the Republican exit strategy. An exit is not a strategy. An exit is an executive order. An exit is not a strategy. It's an order. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says leave. You got one month, in one month, they'll all be out of there. That's the way the military works, you know. So it's not, good, it's not a question of coming up with a strategy. It's very easy to get out of there. Now, I know what the implication of that question is, you know, what will we leave behind? Well, we've already left a mess behind. But we're not making the mess any better. There ain't nobody here. You have your house vandalized and turn around and contract with the vandals to come do the repairs. You know what I mean? That's basically what they're asking people to do. Now, the, you know, this whole question of liberation is kind of a red herring, and that's, that's what we have to be clear on. One of the things that I learned, and, and I had a very peculiar military career, and at one point it took me uh, to, to Central America, where I was working directly under the control of the U.S. Embassy in El Salvador and Guatemala. I was in Guatemala in 1983 during the last coup d'etat in El Salvador in 1985 uh, during the Zona Rosa murders and the kidnapping of Inez Duarte, Guadalupe, and some other what were at the time big news stories that have been pretty well forgotten now uh, as we've, le we've left those messes behind and, and, and allowed those people to crumble under the sort of neoliberal um, structural adjustment programs that we've imposed on them. But, but in, in, in work, working with the U.S. Embassy, I, I got sort of a sneak peek that most soldiers don't get of, of how politics uh, 
actually works. And one of the things that became very clear then has become clear ever since. And it, it wasn't just there. I mean, you know, when I would go, when I was working in Peru and Colombia and places like that, uh, advising people on how to more effectively suppress their own people, uh, I'd have to go through the theater command. I'd have to go through Southcom, which at that time was in uh, Fort Clayton, Panama, and we'd have to brief the Southcom commander because we're in his turf. You know, we're in his in his uh, region of the world, which should tell you something. How many other militaries have commands that are based on the regions of the world? And and we would receive intelligence summaries. They call them int sums because we've got this bizarre sort of clip speak that we use in the military. And we receive these end sums. And they would tell us, for example, when we were working in Peru and Colombia, and supposed to be, they said, you know, if anyone, this is a public affairs officer, would give us the end sum and talk about how we were supposed to speak to this to the public if we were approached by members of the press and so forth. And, and he said, you know, the, the official story is you're down there to work on counter narcotics. Now, you all heard that, right? You all heard that. I mean, you all heard it from the Reagan administration, you heard it from the Clinton administration. All of you out there in John Q. Public, you know what I mean? You heard official pronouncements that said we were involved in a war on drugs. And here I was, I was in 7th Special Forces Group or Delta, and I was going down there, and I was, well, I was in 7th Group whenever I was going down to Peru and Colombia and doing counter narcotics. I couldn't, I, I wouldn't know a drug lab if it bit me in the ass. I wouldn't know it. I would not know what it looked like. They never briefed us on that. They never briefed us. We weren't doing, we weren't doing counter-narcotics work down there. We were doing counter-insurgency training, you know. But if, if we had told the public that, then you wouldn't have co-signed the checks. So official pronouncements, in every case, sometimes they, they reflect the truth, but that's only incidental. Official pronouncements are not designed to represent reality. Official pronouncements are designed to gain your consent and acquiescence to a policy. That's what they're for. That's a very important point. If you don't take anything else home tonight, take that home and then you can just quit listening to all the official pronouncements about Iraq because all they're designed to do is to gain your continued acquiescence. That's what they're for. Because the consent is gone. Actually, the majority of the public now opposes the war in Iraq. But there's enough of a doubt about what we rhetorically are doing over there um, to, to, to give them the cover that they need to continue doing what they're doing and we're not in an open state of rebellion. So if we're not liberating and we're not democratizing and we're not, oh, God forbid, the notion that we could have anything to do with oil over there, I mean, surely we'd be in Iraq if their principal export commodity were t-shirts, right? Yeah. And I'm a Japanese fighter pilot. Um, the reason that we're in Iraq is to establish permanent military bases. That's what we're there for. At the, at, you know, it, we have to sort of put history on fast forward because it moves faster, it moves more slowly than our daily lives. You know, we sort of experience our lives moment to moment and we have a tendency sometimes to confuse the tempo of an individual life with the tempo of history, but history crawls along at a little bit slower and more tendential pace. And, and, and so, uh, you know, we forget that the Cold War has only been over for 16 years. Uh, but that's what's really going on right now, is the Cold War is over. And at the end of the Cold War, what we had was we had this international military that had been deployed around the world to, 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 they, they say to confront a threat, but it wasn't really a threat. It was a threat that they created, again, through provocation, but the primary, the primary quote threat was perceived to be the Warsaw Pact, and that's why we had so many forces that were concentrated uh, in Europe and facing e Eastern Europe. But with, with the, I mean, very abrupt disappearance of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, all of a sudden the disposition of the entire U.S. military became obsolete. Now they had this huge military apparatus, they have to figure out what to do with it now. And it takes a long time to figure that stuff out because we go through various administrations, we've got electoral campaigns to conduct, you know, we've got all sorts of infighting and outfighting, and we've got to figure out what's going on in the rest of the world. And so it took them about 10 years to start making a determination. But don't forget that the Middle East in all this period of time, we're going all the way back when, you can go back to the post-World War II, Eisenhower talked about it, Kennedy talked about it, 
You know, Johnson talked about it, Nixon talked about it, right on up the line, every single one of them. And, and it became a doctrine of the Carter administration that we will never abandon our capacity to impose our military will on that region because it was entirely too strategic. And it's become even more strategic as the oil fields are being depleted in other parts of the world with 60% of the easily, most easily recoverable oil in the world now concentrated around the Persian Gulf. You know, it becomes necessary. And so what's going on right now is, is, is an attempt to reposition the U.S.'s military forces for the next historical period, the post-Cold War period. And the threat, the biggest threat that's perceived right now is the threat of China. And it's, not, it's an economic threat. It's an economic threat. It's a regional threat to American hegemony in the Pacific Basin. But there's also, a, you know, there's always a perennial threat from Japan and Western Europe as, as economic competitors. Or what's the one thing that you can put your hand on that gives you a lever to use against these potential competitors in the future? And if you look at what it is, it's that all three of those entities, China, Japan, and Western Europe, are increasingly dependent on higher and higher quantities of fossil energy, imported fossil energy, and it can only be imported ultimately from one place. And even that place is beginning to see diminishment of their resources. Uh, there's, there's some talk now that the, the giant Gawar oil field in Saudi Arabia may have peaked last year. So this becomes a very urgent sort of strategic necessity from the point of view of an American dominant class that's committed to American international power because they have to secure that power some new way. What they've done is they've approached a new crisis in the wake of, of, uh, of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's become a unipolar world, but they've got to try and maintain that unipolarity. And there are a lot of different approaches out there among these dominant factions. They have a lot of different ideas about how to make this happen. And, and, but all of them agree that the Middle East is critical. You know, the argument is not about, the argument is not about uh, whether we should occupy Iraq right now among those folks. Otherwise, we'd see a lot more Democrats out there saying, get out of Iraq. They're not saying it. And they're not saying it just because they're cowards, though that is a fact sometimes. You know, let's not forget that the Democratic Party sat by and co-signed this war from the get. And they have to take responsibility for that. The vast majority of them signed right on the dotted line and gave executive power to this intellectual mediocrity that occupies the Oval Office right now. They did that, you know. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's because a lot of them are committed to American power, too, and they recognize that they want to keep those bases there right now. But what they've seen is it's turned into a, a political and military debacle. And they, they want to figure out how to get it. And don't forget, you know, the politics of it. You know, things going badly in Iraq for the Republicans is really good for the Democrats. I mean, you know, don't think that those folks aren't just as cynical as that. They are. They always have been. Always will be. Always will be. Uh, but bases, that's what we're there for. You won't ever hear that from the official pronouncements, but that's what we're there for. They want the bases. And th this, is a, this is an outgrowth of a mentality uh, among the so-called neocons. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways to sort of define these guys. And we discussed that earlier today in one of the venues that I was at. And, um, I apologize for my voice being so ragged. I've, I've been on this march from Mobile to New Orleans. We did a lot of hollering. Everybody's voices are shot. <clears throat> um, the neocons, I mean, you can define them also. Some people even go back to like where their philosophical roots are with Levi Strauss and you know, all this, uh, you know, and how Machiavellian they are. It's like as if the other folks aren't Machiavellian. Um, but really the essential difference between them and, and uh, what some people refer to as a realist, which you, know, you could put Kissinger and Powell and some of those in that category, is that they place uh, an overarching emphasis on the use of military power and the militarization of society. They see this as a way to resolve crises in both foreign and domestic policy. And so they, and, and we've noticed that they haven't just tried to militarize the foreign policy. They put all their eggs in the military basket in terms of their foreign policy. But they're trying to do the same thing domestically. And it's just the fact that we fought back so vigorously at home that's prevented them from consolidating that kind of power. But we saw the attempt, you know, with the Patriot Act and all this other stuff. And for a while, they're even considering, you know, establishing military checkpoints all over the country. And, it, you know, Americans don't really do that well with that kind of, uh, population control. Uh, 
at least white Americans don't. Black Americans get subjected to this kind of population control all the time. And so do Latinos. That's something we need to bear in mind. Part of our society has already been colonized and part of our society has already been militarized. Uh, but they want to make that something that's more generalized in, in their domestic policy. But, but this over-reliance on the military uh, partly comes from a lot of people who have very little experience in it. I mean, Donald Rumsfeld's experience in the military was a peacetime fighter pilot. He knows how to fly an airplane, you know, will be. Um, you look at uh, Dick Cheney and Richard Pearl and Paul Wolfowitz and all of them, they don't really have, you know, they're kind of uh, cardboard cutout soldier guys. They're really into all this military stuff, you know, uh, and, and, they, and, and they, they read a lot of books about it. Um, and, and they've given themselves over the impression that you can resolve political problems by military means, you know. And it's true, some, you know, Clausewitz said that uh, war is politics by other means. And that's actually, and, and politics is economics by other means, and you can take this right on down the line. But, but, but uh, uh, these guys are confused. Um, that's why they think establishing bases will somehow catalyze a change that puts, you know, them back in the driver's seat of international power. Uh, they don't understand, they don't understand that uh, military success at the end of the day is not measured by tactical outcomes. It's measured by political outcomes and they've never seen the politics of this. This is an exceptionally self-delusional group of people that's running this country right now. And that's why self-delusional people, and in fact, I, you know, and I really hesitate to use this, Metaphor, because I, I have a lot of questions about psychiatry and the DSM-4 and all that. I think someday we'll look back at all that with the same sort of fascinated horror that we look at the old uh, implements from insane asylums of the 19th century. But nonetheless, I'll use the metaphor. And, 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 and that's that the, this administration seems to manifest all the characteristics of a, of a narcissistic personality disorder. You know, they're completely self-referential. And they surround themselves with people who tell them what they want to hear. And this has really been their downfall. You know, they, they actually did rely on con men like Ahmed Shalabi to advise them on how to go forward with an invasion of Iraq. They really did expect, they really did believe that people were going to go out there and sling rose petals at them like they were the liberators coming into France in 1945 and everything was just going to be fine after that and they were going to go you know, pump oil and pay off the debts and, you know, and, and ride off into the sunset. They, they really believe that. Um, and, and, and now what they're doing is they're trying one thing after another and everything that they try, militarily and politically over there, seems to be more ham-handed than the last thing that they've done in the expectation that maybe one thing they do in some unexpected manner will catalyze a miracle that will switch the situation over and they won't have to give up their bases because they got the bases over there. They got the bases over there. I got a couple of veterans in here now, I think. I can't see them because I got these Klieg lights in my eyes over here, but uh, I can hardly see any of you. But uh, I talked to a couple of brothers today that had just come back from Iraq not too long ago. They can tell you how big LSA Anaconda is, Mosul. Mosul has a, a, a perimeter fence of 65 kilometers. It's a city. It's a city. They got an airfield that will support any aircraft in the world. They have swimming pools, post exchanges, movie theaters. I mean, it's a city. They got everything over there. Uh, you know, and they've got bunkers you can jump into whenever the mortars are incoming. Uh, so they're, yeah. So, you know, the bases are there. The bases are there. But the question is, how do they keep them? Um, and, and because they didn't understand that military success is not predicated on tactical outcomes but on political outcomes, they haven't been able to recognize uh, what's been coming at them all along. And, and, and I, I, can I can describe the, the military defeat that's happening right now fairly easily uh, because in the absence of, you know, if you, have, if you have a conventional military conflict like we had perhaps, you know, they say World War II, you have two clear sides and they're defined by state apparatuses. And so one side formally capitulates to the other side and you have, you know, a victory and a defeat. There's a surrender and then, you know, they say, we'll do what you say and everything is resolved. But this is not that kind of a conflict. In fact, this is a conflict where they went in and intentionally destroyed the state, but left behind pockets, huge pockets of popular resistance and basically an intact army. Uh, and so now, 
They're fighting in a situation where they've created a stateless milieu. And so there is no strategic target available for the United States to go after. And it's a very decentralized and asymmetric form of warfare that's being waged against the United States right now. So when you're in a situation where there's no definitive way to determine who's winning or who's losing, you can't, you know, that they, we got in that situation in Vietnam, and, and so they came up with, you know, Rumsfeld calls it metrics, and McNamara called it body counts. You know, it's bean counting. Only they, instead of counting beans, they were counting dead bodies. They're doing the same thing in Iraq right now. Well, they won't tell you about it because they said once, well, we don't do body counts. That's because they didn't want to count civilian bodies at the time. But, you know, with, with, with Vietnam, it became body counts. And so it became, it became so outrageous. This became the measure of the war. It became so outrageous that at one point, I think it was Clark Clifford or someone that interrogated uh, uh, Westmoreland, and he, he crunched the numbers and he said, you just told me that you've killed off 130% of the opposition. Why is the war continuing? You know, because people were making up body counts. It became the measure of success. So everybody from a buck sergeant all the way up to a general was inflating body counts. They were counting, you know, uh, pigs and chickens and everything else that was laying around. They started counting everything called a body count. You know, to prove that we're killing more of them than they're killing us. Uh, but that doesn't work because, again, that's a tactical outcome. That's not a political outcome. The way that you measure at least where we are right now in terms of who's ahead and who's behind, to, you know, to use a sort of sports metaphor that's completely inappropriate, but the only thing I can think of off the top of my head, is you have to, is you have to look at who has the initiative uh, in a particular conflict. And by that I mean which side is being forced to respond to the initiative of the other side. And it's absolutely undoubtable that in Iraq right now, the U.S. is being forced in every case to react to the initiatives of the resistance. In every case. The only time they've tried to re-seize the initiative is whenever they conduct these, uh, you know, really uh, overwhelming and overwhelmingly lethal uh, operations like the complete destruction of Fallujah, where probably 6,000 civilians were killed in a matter of days. Uh, many of them intentionally in their homes. Many of them massacred, like we're finding uh, out about Haditha right now. Um, this is the nature of this kind of a war. And when you conduct an operation like that to reseize the initiative, what you do is enlist thousands and thousands more people into the resistance. And right now, 80% of the people in Iraq say they want the Americans to leave right now. And we're talking about, you know, we're going we're gonna to liberate Iraq. We're going to liberate Iraq. They've also created a situation politically. So we've lost the initiative, and that's just sort of the tactical assessment. And I don't think there's any way to regain the initiative. <clears throat> but, but politically, and, 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 and this is... Uh, really important because, you know, we have a lot of people who are asking this question, how do we get out? Aren't we going to leave a mess behind? Don't we owe it to the Iraqis to make sure that they can, I don't know, defend themselves even though they don't define who themselves are? Uh, what is the real political situation over there? And, you know, the Bush administration likes to crow about, we, you know, we brought them elections. That's not what happened, y'all. That is not what happened. What happened was, they got, themselves in, they got themselves into a fight in Fallujah where they suffered their first decisive tactical defeat. The first time they went to Fallujah, they had to turn Fallujah over to resistance commanders. They lost Fallujah. That's why they went back in with this vengeance attack and bombed it into oblivion. But they lost Fallujah, and one reason they lost Fallujah was at the same time they were fighting in Fallujah, a second front opened in the Jaff. And let me go back and talk about Fallujah because actually what happened on the, uh, the just uh, a matter of days, a week or two after the occupation began on the, the 20th of March in 2003, uh, elements of the 82nd Airborne Division went into Fallujah. And at that time, nobody had ever heard of Fallujah. And they, they, they went in there. And in Fallujah, the imams and some of the local, you know, some of the local, uh, you know, elders had reestablished order in Fallujah. You know, they had the traffic running, they had a modicum of security, they'd opened up the schools, and they were doing what they knew how to do, self-governance. And the Americans came in and in their, you know, typical diplomatic way said, leave this school, we're using it as our headquarters. And they closed down a school, 
functional school and took over it as their headquarters. And the Fallujans, being Fallujans, who are, um, they are very feisty people, they came out and organized a demonstration out in front of the school. And uh, someone got trigger happy, opened fire, one of the Americans, then several Americans opened fire, and about a dozen people were killed in an unarmed demonstration. We don't ever hear about that, but that's how, that's how the animosity began to develop in Fallujah. And then it just grew from there. Then it just grew from there. You know, it was tit for tat. You know, they'd attack the Americans, the Americans attacked them, more and more people would join the resistance and it built up from there. And then, then it became a rallying point in, in the north or in Anbar province. But at the same time, at the same time, back then, this is when Bremer was running the Coalition Pro Provisional Authority. Um, um, again, in democratizing the nation, they decided to close down all the newspapers that said anything critical about the occupation. And one of the newspapers that said something critical about the occupation was a newspaper of, of Sadr City, which is uh, about a three million strong, uh, poor and working class area inside Baghdad. It's Shia. Uh, and, and their spiritual leader is a, is a young cleric named Muqtada Sadr. Sadr's newspaper was saying that they needed the occupation to leave. So the, the Coalition Provisional Authority shut down their newspaper. And once again they had a demonstration and once again trigger happy troops opened fire and killed unarmed civilians. This is the way the, the Najaf Rebellion started. It wasn't provoked by the Iraqis, it was provoked by the Americans. But it grew, and it grew very rapidly. And the next thing you know, there was a two-front war. You know, there was Najaf, and there was Fallujah, and the U.S. was faced with the loss of everything because all of a sudden the Shia rebellion had spread all the way down into, uh, into uh, uh, Umqasr, all the, way down to the, all the way down to the bay. People were, and they were attacking the Brits as well because it was an Anglo-American invasion occupation. So... They were faced with a situation they needed somebody to pull the cookies out of the fire. And this is when Sistani came along. And Sistani had been insisting on elections all along because Sistani knew that he could control enough of the Shia vote to gain some, you know, to control some political power. But the Americans didn't want Sistani in power. Sistani had spent a good deal of his time in exile in Iran. And the Shias in southern Iraq are very pro-Iranian in many respects. Now I think probably Sadr orients more toward Hezbollah, but nonetheless, you know, Sistani, Sistani who had his uh, sort of popular base in the, in, the, in the Shia petty bourgeoisie in the southern part of Iraq, it's a very strong base because it was well funded and, and because they controlled civil society and so forth. Sistani wanted these elections, but the Americans didn't want elections uh, that were going to put pro-Iranians in power because Iran was second on their target list. So uh, uh, Sistani came along and said, I'll, I'll get you out of this little trick you got yourself into in Najaf and Fallujah, but I won elections. And, uh, and the CPA said, no, nah, we want this. They had this thing engineered where they were going to have like this referendum that involved only certain people. It was, you know, one of these things that are sort of a typical product of a U.S. embassy for other people, of course. And, and uh, Sistani said, no, this is, this is what we're going to have. And that's the reason they had elections in January. It had nothing to do with the Americans deciding they were going to export democracy. Sistani forced them into it. And now the Americans find themselves in a very peculiar situation. And that situation is that they find themselves aligned with a government that's sort of a puppet government and sort of not a puppet government that orients toward Iran. And they're in a situation right now, and we hear a lot of people talking you know, about the threat of the U.S. attacking Iran right now. I dare them to attack Iran. Because if they do, they'll be faced with a generalized rebellion of the entire Iraqi population. Which will result in a decisive military defeat of the U.S. forces in Iraq in a period of a month. I mean, it, it, they simply do not have the forces on the ground to control a society of 27 million people who are hostile to us. Can't do it. So, I mean, this is the political situation they've gotten themselves into. Now, you know, behind the scenes, there are all this stuff about civil war. This mosque bombing, you know, that initiated this latest round of, of vengeance and counter-vengeance. Um, uh, in every case before this, when everybody, anybody did a bombing, somebody would run up and take credit for it. Nobody took credit for that bombing. What was the reason for it? And who did it? See, I don't know, and I'm not making any accusations or anything, but I worked in the special operations field. 
You know, for about 14 years I worked in the special operations field. Um, and I have to wonder, I have to wonder, you know, uh, who, who benefits most from something that's going to provoke an attack on the Sunnis? And for that matter, on Shias, you know. I got an intelligence briefing when I was in Delta back in 1984. Just an intelligence briefing, you know. We got these things once a month. They give us this real thorough intelligence briefing. And the beginning of the briefing went, and I remember this guy, his name was Dennis Chu. He was our, he was our intelligence officer. And he said, good news, the Iran-Iraq war is still going on. That was, that was the attitude. Now, we provoked that one, too. <laughs> we provoked it and funded it behind the scenes. Because we had to set aside our war on pan-Arab nationalism because all of a sudden, out of the blue in 1979, there was a non-Arab, a non-Arab Muslim country that overthrew a U.S. puppet government in Iran. And the only, the only person we could talk in to fighting with them was an Arab nationalist named Saddam Hussein. <laughs> so, see, this stuff, you, have to, you can't, you, you, can, you can control a lot about how people think by deciding where you start history. You know, but this, is, this has been going on for a long time, but it's not going to go on much longer, at least not the way it is right now, because it can't. You know, we were, I was talking to someone earlier, a great line from Chalmers Johnson, is uh, anything that can't go on forever won't. And this won't. Um, we don't just have diplomatic isolation. Uh, we have a ruinous domestic economy from this war right now. Uh, I just came back from a six-day march. We took uh, veterans all the way from World War II to the current war, uh, along with military families, Gold Star families, people who'd lost members of their family in the Iraq War, uh, and hurricane survivors. And we marched from Mobile, Alabama to New Orleans, Louisiana, across three states, went through Mississippi. Uh, saw Long Beach and past Christiana, looks like a nuclear weapon fell on top of those communities. Saw the Ninth Ward that's been depopulated and they're trying to bulldoze houses before they've even brought the cadaver dogs in to find out if any of the 800 missing people are there, you know. Uh, and then I see these figures released a few weeks ago, and this wasn't by, you know, someone like me that could be counted among the left. This was, uh, this was a guy who's a Harvard economist you know, and a, a former economic advisor to the World Bank said that at the end of the day, the Iraq War could cost $2.64 trillion, trillion, trillions of thousand billion, billions of thousand million. Think about it, $2.64 trillion. And I went down to the Gulf Coast and I looked at that and I said, you know, <laughs> how is it that we can build a city in Mosul in a matter of weeks. We can build a city in Balad in a matter of weeks in someone else's desert in order to kill other people and we can't rebuild cities right here at home. I, I don't understand that. I don't understand that. You know, it's, it's like all, this, all, these, all these people have brought on anyone is sorrow. They brought sorrow on our soldiers. They brought sorrow on the Iraqi people. They're bringing sorrow on the people of the Gulf Coast right now. It's shameful. It's shameful. It's criminal, you know. I hear people talk about impeachment. It's just my opinion. I'm not speaking for anyone. I'm not a 501c3, so I can just say it. They ought to throw every one of those people in jail. That's where they belong, you know. <clears throat> I think probably the most probably the most criminal thing about this, and in a way I have to take responsibility for it, or my generation has to take responsibility for it, and this is, you know, I've sort of drifted off from the question of liberating Iraq, and I'd be happy to be challenged on my assessment that we're not doing that in any way, shape, or form, but um, I know we've got a couple of Iraq veterans here, and I'm really happy that you're here, and I was happy that you were here today, and I work a lot with Iraq veterans, and um, my son is an Iraq veteran. He's been there three times. He's in the Army. Uh, you know, he was working at McDonald's. He had an infant. He needed health care. Raised on a military installation. Went to what he knew. You know, uh, I got nothing against soldiers. I was a soldier for too long to have anything against soldiers. Um, 
but we went to sleep. You know, after after Vietnam, we had this period, you know, where everybody was sort of in this post-Vietnam malaise, and we really started to believe that we'll never take a whole generation of young people and do this to them again. We, we really convinced ourselves that that was true. Uh, and it turned out to be wrong. It turned out to be wrong. We, uh, we got a whole generation and we're doing it to them again. So, um, I'm not really sure what to say about that except that, you know, we've got to figure out a way to, to, to stop this particular war, but even more importantly, you know, we can't afford to get, sort of get sucked into the consumer bacchanalia that took our eye off the prize after, 19, after the 1960s and 70s, you know. We got drawn into something else. We got drawn into the end of history. We got drawn into, you know, there is no alternative, you know. We got drawn into, uh, you know, if I'm middle-aged, I've got to give up the struggle and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, now we're watching another generation being thrown into a charnel house. You know, and bitten, being sent back, you know, dead, wounded, crazy. You know, we're watching the destruction of another whole society. And yeah, we're going to stay, in, we're gonna stay in, in the Middle East until we've killed three million there like we did in Southeast Asia. You know, uh, it's, it's unconscionable. It's, and and, I, and I've, I'm a grandfather now. I've got a three-year-old grandson. And, um, yeah, I want to stop this war, but in the process of stopping this war, I want to make sure that whatever political organization uh, we can put together to stop this war, that we don't stop there. We continue to aggrandize and improve that organization and actually seek to take political power away from the dominant class in this country. Because if we don't transform the whole system, we're going to have another war again. And I have no intention of watching my three-year-old grandson put on a Kevlar helmet or body armor. And I don't want to see it happen to any of your grandchildren either. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and close. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I'll entertain questions, comments. Yep. Thanks. Just so people know, uh, this is being taped. We will be broadcasting this on GRTV down the road, and we're going to be making DVDs available for folks who want to be able to share this with other people. If you have questions, if folks could just come down to either of the mics here, you know, feel free to sit nearby or get in line or whatever you want to do so that we can get your questions uh, recorded on the mics. So um, who's, who's, who's first here? Come on up. Come on up. Don't be shy. Uh, good speech. Um, I have arguments with some people that I know that are on the far right spectrum on this, and they, you know, they always tout the Bush line. I, we can't give them a timetable. The terrorists win, you know. And, and you're talking about, you know, well, we could just pull out just like now. But the big question is left unsaid. You know, if we said, okay, our timetable is six months, and we do pull everybody out, you know, what do you foresee happening um, with Iraq if we pulled all of our troops out? Yeah. I, I, I don't have any way of knowing. Um, but, but I, I, I have as much confidence, I have more confidence that the Iraqis can figure it out than that we can. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a society here that's about 400 years old, and they're living in one that's about 6,000 years old. They, they'll figure this out for themselves. The whole, the whole question of the internecine struggles between different factions inside Iraq right now is one that's set up by and distorted through how people have to relate to the occupying force. So withdrawal of the occupying force really presents a situation where most of the people there, the majority of the people who constitute the popular bases of the, uh, bases of the leadership factions inside Iraq right now, are, are they, they don't want anything special. They want, you know, security. Uh, jobs, food, you know, the kind of stuff that most of us want. They want, they want their children to go to school. <clears throat> Iraq was actually a very vital modern society before we attacked it in 1990. It was the only society in the region that had, like, legal equality for women, you know. Uh, they don't tell you about that stuff. It had, you know, free education all the way through graduate school. It had free public health system and so forth. And no doubt there were some drawbacks. I mean, you know, Saddam Hussein was also a cheap thug, but, 
you know, so is George Bush. For that. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it, right now, right now, like the Skiri and the Dawa were the dominant groups over there, right? And the Skiri is actually employing uh, on, on behalf, and they're the ones who are in league with the occupation, uh, which sort of, this is what's caused a stalemate because the Skiri, the Supreme Council for uh, Islamic Revolution in Iraq, is, is, is the group, is the dominant group that orients toward Iran. Uh, but at the same time, they're, they're joined at the hip under the current situation to the occupying forces. And so other uh, guerrilla forces are forced to attack the Skiri as a tactical necessity. Uh, when you have a, a, a weaker force facing up against a technologically far superior force, then your greatest advantage is in surprise, and the way that you achieve surprise is to blind and deafen your enemy. And the eyes and ears of the American occupation are their Iraqi collaborators. And so it becomes necessary from a tactical standpoint for the smaller guerrilla forces in the country, particularly the ones that are coming out of Anbar and places in the north, um, that they have to attack the police, they have to attack the militias, they have to attack. And the Badr militias, by the way, who will act on behalf of the Dawan Skiri, uh, are uh, Iranian-trained militias that are now operating very much like Salvadoran death squads. Um, so we're starting to see that kind of dynamic take place. But if you withdraw the occupation, then the quickest route to security, education, uh, you know, economic stability and all that becomes uh, cooperation between the different groups. And I, everybody likes to look at where the oil is. The oil is up in Kirkuk. Now, that, that's another problem we hadn't even talked about is Kurdistan, <laughs> which the, you know, the U.S. is sort of finding itself saddled with that into perpetuity right now because as quick as the Kurds declare independence and they're going to be a war with Turkey. I mean, you know, it's just a... They've made a pretty good mess of everything over there, but, but uh, it'll get sorted out, I think, uh, more effectively and more quickly and more immediately in the interest of the people who live there if they're the ones who are making the decisions. I think there's far less chance of civil war in the absence of an occupation than there is with one. They say we've got to keep the occupation there to prevent a civil war, but it looks to me like a civil war over there right now. You know, a civil war with everybody else against whoever is joined with the occupation. Yes, ma'am. I think most everyone is familiar with the journalist Helen Thomas, who was finally mm -hmm. allowed to question the president recently. Yeah. And her question, which has gone unanswered, was, why did you want to go to war in Iraq, President Bush? Now, some of us who have already put out our own thoughts on this, the first thing, when you read books like The Oil Factor, understand that we've reached peak oil. If that's your understanding, we said it's the oil. Other people said it's a geopolitical. We're in a great position to control the area around us. Some of us said, well, Saddam Hussein's going to switch to the euro and all of our portfolios are going to bottom out, uh, just as the tech hit sort of uh, tremors sort of hit, took a 15%, 20% dive. So I've got three possible reasons. I'd like to know what your thought is, and if I could ask one other question, how does Saudi Arabia play into this whole scheme and our partnership with, with them? Thank you. I yeah, enjoy no, this. Thank, thank you. Um, well, I mean, watch me push this off the side and embarrass myself. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the reason they need bases in Iraq is because Saudi Arabia expelled us. And the reason that Saudi Arabia expelled us is because, I mean, Osama bin Laden is a Saudi. And Osama bin Laden's interest has always been, from the very beginning, he's never been, like, unclear about this. We don't ever hear what he has to say here because we've got to portray him as, like, you know, the evil genius. Uh, but it's political power. He's a member of a very influential political family inside Saudi Arabia. And, and, and Saudi Arabia uh, has a very corrupt administration, and bin Laden has always been seeking political power there. So the way you go after the royal family is to go after uh, you know, their, their benefactor and patron, which I think it has a lot to do with 9-11. I think this has been very much about Saudi Arabia from the very beginning, with the expulsion from bases. 
means that we lost, you know, a foot. It's very difficult to project power from the United States around the world. You have to have bases because, you know, planes only fly so far without putting fuel in them. <laughs> it takes a, a tremendous, you have to build these huge logistical bases in order to support, you know, to project that force out. And they saw Iraq as, the, as sort of the logical uh, first place to go in and establish a basis. So I think that's it. I've heard the Euro thesis and I'm not convinced about it. Uh, because I'm, I'm not convinced that the Europeans themselves are, are, are ready to, you know, sell the dollar short, or I don't think anybody else is going to do that, because they'd wipe out the value in their own central bank reserves, and I don't think anybody's going to commit economic suicide. That's, you know, the whole economic system right now is a game of chicken that the U.S. plays. That's why we can, you know, we borrow money and then we just sort of use a printing press to pay it off, and everybody, you know, pretends that it's like not happening, you know, it's like the, the emperor is fully dressed. Um, uh, but definitely, I mean, you know, oil has a lot to do with it. And um, peak oil has been controversial, though I have no idea why it's controversial, because the empirical evidence for it is absolutely overwhelming. Uh, but it's not just a question of peak oil, it's the pricing of oil, and it's the demand for oil, and it's the demand trend lines for oil. And if you look at, again, you look at a place like China that's on this incredibly fast industrialization track, uh, they, they require huge quantities of oil. And, and the projection is even though, uh, even though you know, there's still only number two to the United States as a net importer, is that as these supplies begin to diminish, as production begins to diminish, then that puts them in direct competition. Uh, with the United States. Uh, so, you know, definitely that ha had something to do with it. But it's also a question of, you know, what do we do with this military? And one of the other, and again, I don't think that, uh, and, and this is, Tariq Ali and other people are saying that this is what it was all about, you know, and I'm not sure that it's what it was all about. It was certainly a reason for the war was the U.S. wants an opportunity. Uh, the U.S. behaves like a bully. If you think about where we go project our military for, I was involved in the invasion of Grenada, okay? an island that's five miles long, you know, uh, that has a population of Leesburg, Virginia, you know, and we went in there and like pounced on this uh, little island, um, I don't know, to protect the strategic nutmeg supply for the world or something, uh, <clears throat> you know, because there, were, because there was a government there that we didn't approve of, and it was a way to, I don't know, recoup after 258 Marines had been killed in a bombing in Lebanon, because uh, it happened five days later, grenade invasion did. Uh, but, but people talk about demonstration effect. And it's the idea that, you know, we can go out there and demonstrate this overwhelming military. If you remember I'm talking about shock and awe? You know, shock and awe. And I mean, I think they, this administration like really digs that kind of language, you know, it's like shock and awe. And what they were going to do was go over there and demonstrate American military invincibility to the rest of the world as an object lesson. That's a demonstration effect. And if that was one of their objectives, they failed on that one too, like big time, because now the whole world is looking around and saying, man, they got themselves pinned down over there, which they do. Uh, so it's had, once again, just as in the political realm and the military realm and now in the sort of psychological operations realm in terms of world politics, they failed. But I think it's a combination of those reasons. I think a lot of these things are overdetermined. I don't think politics is linear. By any far. I don't think it's a like cause and effect. And don't forget that you have a lot of people involved in decision-making processes. And uh, I, I don't even pretend, to, I don't even know if I want to know like what goes on in the mind of someone like Dick Cheney. I, it might be a really frightening thing to, uh, to, to be privy to. Yes, ma'am. Yeah? Um, oh. I think she was... Oh, oh I'm sorry. I can't see anything. Um, what... What kind of concrete steps would you suggest that a, just sort of an ordinary nine to five person can take to address these issues? Oh, thank you. Y'all have Congress people? Yes. Um, go camp out in their offices. Go camp out in their offices. Those of you that can't afford to go uh, sit in their offices and occupy them until you get dragged out in flex cuffs, buy their pizza and support them and pay their bail. Do whatever you have to do to your individual congressperson right now to get them to do two things. One, join the Out of Iraq caucus. Two, don't vote another penny 
to support this occupation. That's something we can all do locally. The other thing we can get involved in is going out and, and, and stalking the local recruiters' offices and don't let them get any more of our young people in the military. Because the military is hurting right now. <clears throat> now, I say that as someone who lost that fight with my own son, you know what I mean? But still, I know that a recruiter has to get, you know, maybe one or two people a month. If you can deny them just one, you know, you might be cutting their quotas by 50%. And I hate to say it, but one of the ways that this war is going to stop is whenever the force is so degraded that it can't afford to fight anymore. And that's an ugly thing to say, but I don't see any other way around it. I don't see these people in this administration changing their mind. That's some pig -headed, there's some pig-headed people up there right now. Now, what happens after the 2006 election, I don't know. You know, if, if all of a sudden, you know, the Democratic Party wins, and I don't know if they can even do that. We've got scandal after scandal after scandal going on right now. It seems like it ought to be easy, but if the Democrats have proved one thing here in the last couple of years is that they're very adept at snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, <clears throat> And, 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 and uh, uh, you know, if they do manage to, maybe there'll be some impeachment hearings if we can give half of them a spine transplant. I don't know. But, but in the meantime, I do know that congressperson by congressperson, uh, we've got something we can hold over a Democratic con congressperson's head right now. And that's the margin that it takes to win in a congressional race. And there's enough people who are active against the war that can threaten to withhold a vote. It has to be a credible threat, and it's a risky strategy, but it's something we can do. And if you're not prepared to go that far with it, we can at least go up there and talk to them. I, I, talked, to a, I talked to a state senator one time in North Carolina, Wib Gully, and he said, you know, if I, get 12, if I get 12 letters or calls on the same subject in one day, that's a flood. You know, so if we just get these Congress people and pick on them, I mean, really pick on them, arrange meetings with them, and wear them down, join the Out of Iraq Caucus, and don't vote any more money for the war. That's, that's something we can do concretely. And, and, and go down there and engage, you know, support people who are doing counter-recruitment. That's some real easy stuff we can do, you know. And then the other stuff is, you know, show up. Show up whenever we do things like demonstrations up in D.C. and New York. And I know it's a pain in the ass, you know, but it, you go up and meet nice people. And, and we do have our numbers up there. And it does make a difference. It does make a difference. We don't think, we don't think that we've uh, uh, made any progress in fighting this war because, you know, we haven't stopped the war. But we have, because at one point it was overwhelmingly supported, and now it's overwhelmingly opposed. You know, so we've won the hearts and minds of our countrymen. Now we've got to do is, you know, is 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 we, is we have to, uh, is we have to get those same people uh, mo motivated and mobilized, and and doing exactly what you said. We need to give people something concrete to do, because everybody can't go out and be like you know a professional revolutionary. Or you know, yes, ma'am. Oh. It's a lot easier to sit in this room and talk about uh, impeaching George Bush and all the things that you were talking about that I think everybody here already agrees with. What's really interesting is trying to talk to people who don't agree with you, and those are the people, you know, I think we need to reach. And I actually knew the girl who was up there, Kat, <clears throat> as part of my question is, is what do we do, but I don't think we need to tell truth to power anymore. What we need to do is find each other on the street and tell the truth to the people who, for one reason or another, haven't been hearing all the facts. I'm really curious, you, you quoted all those um, facts about the, the beginnings of what happened in Najev and, and Fallujah. Where, where did you get that information and how can we get that? So when we talk about stuff, yeah. we have... I, I, I got it from news reports, but I was tracking the news reports from the beginning of the war. It actually was really accessible to me because when we kicked off the Bring Them Home Now campaign, and we'd already started organizing for that even before the war started. I was doing a news brief. I'd go around and sort of scour the news through the Google News, get all the international news every day, and find the five most relevant stories I could find every day and publish them. And so I had this huge archive of news material that just, so you know what I mean, it sort of disappears from the collective memory as time goes past, and I ended up using a lot of that to write the second book. Do you, do you, uh, do you have that available on your website? Um, it, it actually, it, the best place to go would be bringthemhomenow.org, and there's a section that says news, and you can hit previous, 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 and it'll give you two and a half years of daily news stories. Now, once in a while, you'll bump into one where the URL doesn't work anymore, but most of them are in there, and they're archived, and it's an extremely valuable resource if you have a lot of time. <laughs> 
You have to have a lot of time. And there's images in there, too. There's some pretty stark images in there. Uh, in terms of what you're saying about not just preaching to the choir and going and getting some more people in the choir, I couldn't agree more. But I think we have been effective at that at some, because we have changed from, you know, 25% to 65% or whatever it is now. So apparently some new people have been won over. Um, when, when I was in the Gulf Coast this past week, um, one of the guys that joined our march, and the march was saying bring the troops home and bring the survivors home. That was uh, the thesis of the march. We were connecting the two issues. And uh, there was a guy, a white man in Mississippi, and this is a very clear demographic for those of us who live down that neck of the woods, you know. He was a guy that, you know, wore the camouflage stuff and, you know, looked like he was ready to go out and shoot Bambi and all that. Uh, he'd been rendered homeless by the hurricane, and he'd been homeless ever since. And uh, he had this old car his brother had loaned him, and it had a Confederate flag sticker on one side, and it had uh, uh, W is my president on the other side. And this man ended up marching with us for three days and, and adopting our point of view on the war because we were the only people that came. And it wasn't because we went up there and yammered at him about the war. In this particular case, and this was interesting to me, it was because we were the only people that ever came along and listened to him tell what happened to him. Um, it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but, but um, um, transformation usually comes in the wake of trauma. Uh, that's, that's when we suddenly become teachable. When we're comfortable, we're complacent. Uh, but I mean, to me, that was a huge victory for us, you know, for this guy to join us. And I wanted him with us just like he looked, you know what I mean? Because that gave permission to other people who had an instant cultural recognition of this guy as one of them. You know, he's just a good old boy from down in Mississippi. And, and it, it gives other people permission to come out and say, you know, I was wrong. I was wrong. So, yeah, I, I completely agree, sister. We've got we to gotta, we gotta, uh, uh, amplify the choir in numbers and volume. Yes, sir. Um, you said that, um, that we wouldn't attack Iran, um, especially because we're pretty much sitting ducks in, in Iraq right now. Mm -hmm. But what happens if, if and when we somehow pull out of Iraq because of running out of money or, or, or they, they, there's a huge civil war? <laughs> Whatever reasons eventually we were pulling out, would we then consider Iran as more of a target, or are we going to do that anyway? I don't know, but <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the, the geopolitics here and, yeah. and if, if Iran remains a target. I, yeah, I, uh, I, I, didn't say, I didn't say they wouldn't. <laughs> I said it wouldn't be smart. Yeah, well, okay, uh, that's different. That don't mean they won't. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, <laughs> Um, hubris can make people stupid, and these folks have got it in spades. I mean, oh, Lordy. Um, so, I mean, yeah, they may. They're over there rattling their sabers right now. Anytime these people start calling somebody Hitler, I start to get nervous, you know what I mean? As soon as they start calling somebody Hitler, it usually means they're about to drop a bomb on them or launch a Tomahawk cruise missile at them. Uh, but, but, I mean, from, their own, <laughs> from, from the point of view of their own self-interest, it doesn't seem to me to make any sense for them to attack Iran right now. I don't mean they won't do it. Uh, but with that caveat, um, I don't know. I don't know what will happen when they leave Iraq. My, my, sense is, my sense is that people are so fed up with this one that it's going to be very difficult to get the public behind uh, another war, uh, you know, based on someone saying that there's a threat of weapons of mass destruction. They've pretty much worn that story out. Uh, uh, but, I mean, I don't know. I mean, certainly, you know, they'd be in a better strategic position, I suppose, but, um, you know, a lot changes. I'm, I'm just sort of focused right now on, let's see what we can do to stop this one. And I think by stopping this one, it's, that's actually, stopping this war is an exercise of popular power against the elites in this society. What we have to do is, once we, once we gain that power, we've got to quit surrendering it back to them and being complacent, you know. Yes, sir. This may sound like a swift uh, a shift of subject. That's all right. But uh, what do you think our government is doing now in Venezuela? 
That's, that's actually the same subject. Funny thing happened on the way to Iraq. The um, U.S. got pinned down over there, and then all of a sudden, a lot of the people felt. Again, remember, you know, uh, this this demonstration effect thing. You know, military U.S. invincibility has been called into question by the Iraqi resistance. It's been called into question all over the world. Um, and this fellow Hugo Chavez, is a pretty canny character. He he seems to know his stuff. He's immensely popular, uh, partly because he does. You know crazy things like support literacy initiatives and, you know, uh, puts women's rights into the Constitution and all these other things that we haven't managed to do here yet. Um, and I, and I, full disclosure, I, I'm a big partisan of Hugo Chavez, and not just because he's a paratrooper like I was, but I think it's really cool that, um, you know, that once again, yeah, th this is the one situation where we've actually seen uh, uh, a country's military act as part of a transformative force in society and a progressive force in society. You know, uh, I only wish we could see something like that here. Uh, you know, take the, the latent talent and creativity of the people we have in our armed forces and aim it at some sort of a great social project like that. That would be, oh, uh, something to behold, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, he has oil, <laughs> and, and this is definitely an energy war at some level. Um, and uh, the U.S. is uh, a unipolar world power, and the example that he's setting is a very dangerous example, and in fact, it's empowered people. We had this conversation earlier today because I was around a number of people who have a good deal of experience in Latin America. I mean, we're, we're talking about imperialism. It is a system, and it really does work, and it is self-reproducing regardless of who the character mask are who are sitting up at the helm of the ship at this particular time, you know. Um, uh, I think they're very, you know, I think this government's very hostile to Hugo Chavez. In fact, they called him Hitler recently, which is, again, a pretty uh, grim prognostic indicator. <laughs> but um, he's been pretty good at outwitting them so far. They conducted a coup d'etat against his government, and the U.S. recognized the coup government, and then he took his government back two days later, which is very cool. Um, if, you, if, anybody's, if, anybody's, if you haven't seen a film called The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, you have to see that film. It's like the most redemptive 70 minutes you'll spend, because like, God damn it, we win one time. You know what I mean? It's really, really good. <laughs> and And... And uh, I mean, for me personally, for me personally, it, it's about this coup. It, historic footage because these Irish filmmakers were actually in the National Palace before, during, and after the coup, which I don't think anybody's ever filmed something like that firsthand before. With the cabinet members, the film actually tracks the military, these military click carrying Hugo Chavez out and arresting him, and actually films him coming back into the back into the palace two days later. And um, there's this scene uh, where, you know, at first they conceal the coup from the public and the public sort of finds out through their various networks and then all of a sudden the masses are aroused and they crowd in around the National Palace and they're holding pictures of Chavez. Again, you know, not because this is a cult of personality because this is the embodiment of their aspiration for popular sovereignty. And, you know, these poor people are outside the, the, the National Palace with just tears streaming down their eyes, de demanding, you know, the return. And all these, all these coup makers who were gloating just hours before are all of a sudden sort of, you know, peeking out the curtains over the saying, what's up out there? And the next thing I see, and I said this for personally, for me personally, this was like a, a huge thing in that film. Uh, there's this group of young paratroopers, they go in and retake the palace, and one of them goes up on the roof and takes his beret off and waves it as a signal to the people around the palace that the palace has been taken back. And everybody just, they start cheering and crying. And all these people go up and embrace these soldiers. And it was this fusion of the population with their armed forces that was just incredibly powerful. I see some people nodding. It was like, if, if you can watch that film with, with, with a dry eye, you're, you're, you're not human. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just because, and it's real. That's the thing. Is is it's it's all completely real. Um, 
the, the U.S. is already starting some stuff up on the border. You know, they're trying to organize. They couldn't organize this, uh, this fake political opposition that was being organized out of the U.S. Embassy to, to really... I mean, they're a real political opposition. They're totally class-based and race-based, too. Venezuelan elites are some stone-cold racist. I spent a couple months down there working with them, uh, straight up. They, one of the reasons they really despise Chavez is not just his populist politics, I would say even socialist politics, but the fact that he's part black and Indian also has a lot to do with it. The Venezuelan whites are vicious racist. Not all of them, but among the elites, it's like the norm. And... and uh, uh, they, now they, that failed and they're organizing this uh, secessionist movement up where the oil is right now. It's like one thing after another. They'll keep trying stuff because they're very alarmed about Chavez. Chavez is using the price of oil went up and all of a sudden the, you know, the coffers are flush and Chavez is uh, implementing social programs all over the country. And the other thing he's doing is offering low interest loans to Brazil and Argentina to allow them to pay down the principal on their IMF debt within the next year, which means that two major countries in Latin America, three major countries in Latin America, will no longer be under the, the boot heel of the International Monetary Fund. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we, we could be witnessing in Latin America right now the first steps in the dissolution of an empire. And, and, and I think we should welcome that because I don't want to be an imperialist. You know, and I don't think anybody here does. Yes, sir. With the uh, backdrop of the New American Century uh, project and the administration's involvement in that, uh, and the idea that they had uh, felt that a new nine or new Pearl Harbor was necessary to maybe meet some of their goals, um, there's mounting evidence and support for the possibility that our government uh, participated or allowed 9/11 to happen. Does this uh, horrific possibility surprise you? And do you think they may decide to do another 9-11 uh, to garner more support for Ar Iran or some other aggression or to put down the, uh, the groups that are right now moving towards trying to develop an, a genuine investigation into 9-11? I was um, among some of the first people that raised a lot of hard questions about 9-11 right after it happened, and there were some very suspicious circumstances. Um, but, you know, over time and on reviewing the evidence that's emerged, I, I, I believe there's a possibility that the U.S. government had foreknowledge of it, but I don't think that the U.S. government engineered or participated in it. Um, that's a long, you know, because that, uh, the people who do believe that, including some people that I know fairly well, um, you know, you have to sort of do evidence, counter evidence, it becomes a very sort of arcane debate, uh, just say, you know, whether or not you believe that the U.S. is complicit uh, in that. I, I, I don't think they did. I think bin Laden did it. I think he did it as part of a provocation to see if he couldn't sort of, you know, judo the United States into an involvement in the Middle East that would pin them down, and he was extremely successful. So, I mean, you know, look, look who bin Laden's primary enemies were. They were the House of Saud, uh, they were Saddam Hussein, and they were the U.S. government. So who's sitting in the catbird seat right now? You know, who's, who's, who's smiling and who's not smiling right now? And if, if, if it did, it turns out he's a lot smarter than George Bush, but that's really not a great achievement. Um, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are very wedded to the idea of U.S. complicity in it. But the, uh, uh, among other reasons, I think the primary reason that I um, have come myself, at least, to dismiss that um, is that having worked... Uh, in the covert operations field for a fair amount of time myself, I know how difficult it is to keep a secret. And a conspiracy of that scale and that complexity would involve so many people that it would be impossible to keep it a secret for very long. Uh, people have consciences, and they come out and talk about things after they happen by and by. Uh, they may not all, and I'm not saying, you know, that uh, ruling elites don't use conspiracies to carry out their, uh, to carry out their uh, uh, agendas, but I, I, I'm not convinced that the U.S. was complicit in 9-11. Yes, sir. 
Uh, I know this is a huge question, and you just wrote a book about it, but could you talk a little bit about connections between um, gen uh, militarism and sexism? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I try not to even refer to it as sexism, and I'll, let me explain why. Uh, because um, the term racism and the term sexism um, sort of carry with them uh, the implication that these are uh, personal pathologies, you know? That it's a, I'm a racist or I'm a sexist is because I have a personal pathology. You know, I'm not evolved enough or, you know, I have some sort of a problem that's personal and individual that causes me to dislike or to devalue uh, women or people of color kind of thing. And, and, and uh, I, I think um, what's important to understand is that those kinds of attitudes are reflections of social structures of unequal power, you know, of, of relationships of domination, subordination. So I, I tend to think of it more as, as patriarchy than sexism. Does that make sense? Just as I think, you know, racism is really a form of uh, racial national oppression and, and not merely, you know, that some of us you know, haven't learned to, to like, cherish diversity or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not being, I don't mean to be flip about that, but it's sort of irritating with this notion that if we all just cherish diversity, everything will be okay. And it doesn't take into account, you know, the, the fact that there are structural inequalities. And they're not just inequalities. They're not merely inequalities. They are uh, relationships in which the dominant group exists as a dominant group across from the subordination of a subordinated group. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a, a fusion of opposites. There's no right without a left. There's no up without a down. Um, I, and and I, I could go on for a long time about gender and militarism. Uh, and, you know, in writing about militarism, and writing about militarism in the second book, Full Spectrum Disorder, I, you know, I, I was increasingly confronted um, with the fact that you, you can't, you can't really explore the whole phenomenon of militarism, economic militarism, cultural militarism, uh, political militarism, uh, without engaging the question of gender, uh, because it's very, very, very gendered, which is so incredibly obvious that it becomes invisible. You know, and we see it in our popular culture all the time. Just look at any representation you have at war, and you see all these sort of uh, uh, masculine conventions. You know, masculinity constructed as aggression, and 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 the ability to project violence and that kind of thing. You know, I mean, it's 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 so common that we sort of again we invisibilize it. We pretend it's, we don't we don't even notice that it's there because we grow up with it. Um, but constructions of masculinity as a particular form of I mean, you know, there are all sorts of masculinities depending on where you. I mean, you know, there's a, there are there are masculinity, and and I'm not a big supporter. I'm not saying we come up with a kinder, gentler masculinity, and I don't want to go drum and sweat lodges or any of that stuff. I you know, I think the whole problem is masculinity to begin with. I think we just need to, it needs to be abolished. But that's a long struggle. Um, uh, you know, along with femininities and all the all these other sort of uh, bipolarities that are. Uh, the behavioral expectations of a system of unequal power between men and women that plays out in all sorts of things like homophobia and whatnot. Um, if you if you if you look at the, the archetype of soldiers, they're really just sort of the hypertrophied archetype of men. Uh, and if you think about the way the ways that we talk metaphorically about violence are always sexualized, and the ways that we talk about sex are always violent, and always, but in many cases, violent, from, from, from a male point of view. And the males here who've ever been in a locker room can substantiate that for me. You know, we know when we get in all male environments, we sort of feed on that stuff, you know. <clears throat> and, and I won't become overly graphic, but I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I wrote about in the book, and I've actually got this floating around online somewhere, was I did a, a movie review, which is something I don't do, I'm not like a cultural critic, really, and I'm not very good at that. And some of the movies are just so awful, I don't want to deal with them afterwards. But in this particular case, my son sat me down and, and had me watch uh, Man on Fire. Uh, any of you seen that? It's a Denzel Washington film. 
There are so many conventions related to gender in there and militarism. You really, sh well, I hate to say go out there and like give money to the people who made that awful film, but still, it's 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 worth having a look at because, um, you know, in it, in it, uh, Denzel Washington's character, a formal special operations soldier, of course, and you know, one who's trying to get God to forgive him because of all the bad things he did. You know, he's this sort of uh, tragic anti-hero. Uh, he's going out to save a damsel in distress. I mean, it's, it's some really cheesy conventions. It's done very well. The production values are high, and it's sort of, it's jump cut and musicified, so it's really palatable for a younger generation and all that. But the signature scene in that film, there's a couple signature scenes, and one of the, one of the things it does is it justifies torture, and it comes out right about the same time that there's this big controversy around Abu Ghraib prison. And, and so in order to get the information to save the damsel in distress, he has to do things like tape someone's hand to a steering wheel and systematically cut off their fingers, and the audience is sort of invited uh, to participate in this cathartic moment when he starts amputating the fingers of this dark foreigner and the fact that Denzel is dark it makes him sort of a decoy in this one. But uh, uh, the, the, the really signature scene is where he uh, captures one of the bad guys, again, a, a bad foreigner, and tapes him down to the back of a car and symbolically rapes him by pushing explosives into his anus. And at the end of the scene, at the end of the scene, he walks away and it explodes in this climactic moment. Now, you could write master's theses in psychology on all the reasons that this was such a popular scene in this movie. You know, but the construction of aggression is rape. Uh, you can go on and on and on. This, the, the, the gender implications of militarism are extremely deep. That's why I ended up writing a book about it. I could have written like an encyclopedia, but I, I just had to stop, you know? I had to stop. Once you start, you know, digging into the literature on it, it just, oh, mercy, it goes everywhere. But I don't want to use up the whole time. It's there, though. It's there. Um, what's our time look like? Does anybody know? I don't want to keep everybody up past their bedtime. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Okay, that works for me. <laughs> um, what, you said, what you said earlier about... Um, I forget the exact language about how um, transformation follows in the wake of trauma. Yeah. And I'm thinking about how we're all socialized as American citizens, all of us, to kind of, much, kind of be concerned with what's going on here and not anywhere else. Yeah. And I was thinking when you said that about the role historically and contemporarily Israel has played in this, our relationship more accurately mm -hmm. with Israel has played. What are your thoughts on the American public in general being able to confront our own foreign policy and what role do you think, um, how much of that ability you think will be dependent on our ability to understand historically and contemporarily what is happening with Israel, our support of it, and how the rest of the world sees that situation? It's one of the most difficult foreign policy questions we have to confront because both parties have embraced Zionism as part of the strategy, as a, as a strategic necessity. Um, and, 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 and what we have to overcome are a whole lot of things. This is so contradictory. A, a lot of people have been very successful at portraying anybody who opposes the Israeli state as being anti-Semitic. Uh, it, it, but people have been very successful at equating Zionism, which is an expansionist political ideology, one that was secular, by the way, with Judaism, or with the, with the Jewish people. Uh, and it's not the same thing, but that conflation has been very effective. It's pretty easy to paint anybody who opposes uh, Israeli policies as being an anti-Semitic. Uh, it's also very difficult to argue on behalf of the Palestinians because they've been so effectively demonized. You know, Arabs and Muslims uh, have, have been effectively demonized. In fact, the only people that it's, you know, like permissible to do uh, racist stereotypical images of, like in political cartoons and whatnot anymore, seem to be Arabs and Muslims. 
you know, we used to get away with that with a lot of people here at home, but it's getting harder and harder to do because folks have gained enough of a political toehold to fight back against that stuff, but it still seems to be, you know, fairly permissible to attack Arabs and Muslims. Um, the Israeli state is an expansionist state. And, and, but, but it's going to take a huge public education effort for us to get that through to people because people don't know the history of the region. They don't know the history of the region. What they've, you know, they've seen, uh, you know, they, they remember when they were young, we saw Exodus, you know what I mean? And that's our whole perception of, of what happened with the birth of the Israeli state. We don't know anything about, you know, the ideology of, of Jabotinsky. Uh, we don't know anything about the Stern Gang or the Irgun. We don't know anything about the stuff that's actually about the Der Yassin massacre. We don't know anything about the fact that like 90% of the potable water that's available in Palestine has now been seized by the Israelis. Uh, you know, the, the fact that they've seized most of the arable land. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 it, it's, it, there's a, and, and, and one reason is, is because there's absolute unity across both parties in the ruling circles in this country and including, you know, and the media always reflects those dominant sort of uh, political paradigms. Uh, we don't have any sort of alternative discourse about what's going on in Palestine and Israel right now. Um, and it's become, it's a very complex problem. I mean, you know, it's not like we can resolve it just like that. I mean, I never hear anybody talk about a single state solution anymore. It gets talked about by people outside the United States because everybody outside the United States knows a lot about it and seem to talk about it all the time. But it's it's one of those subjects that's been sort of encapsulated and shelved away in a particular pigeonhole, and, and we all have all the information that we seem to need. And there's no way for us to understand the position of the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis the whole region or vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world if we don't understand the U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Palestine. Um, our uncritical support of Israel has made us, has, has consistently worked against us in the region. Now, <sighs> At the same time, I don't want to say, you know, we need to have more influence, you know what I mean? That, that's, that's not what I'm arguing, but, but uh, you know, I'm saying that the, the ignorance of the body, body, body politic inside the United States and the whole question is colossal, which implies that we have, those of us who may have taken a look at the issue of Israel and Palestine have a responsibility to research that more deeply and, and to, make that, to make that issue uh, accessible and popular and to go out and do public education on it. It's, it's a really urgent need. I think there's two, the two P issues that I think need to be discussed in this country that are sort of off the radar because neither political party had touched them is Palestine and prisons. You know, we need to educate the public on the reality in Palestine and we need to educate the public on 2.1 million people being incarcerated inside the United States and what the conditions are inside those prisons. You know, I know that's sort of a shift from Palestine to prisons, but, you know, it, 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 don't we hear people talk about human rights violations in China all the time? Yeah, China's got one point, almost 1 1.4 billion people. You know how many people they got in prison? One and a half million. We got 2.1 million. And we're less than a quarter their size. How does that, you know, how does that, how does that happen? Uh, and we're not asking questions about it. And who are the people who are in prison? We're not asking questions about that either. And what's the relationship between prison here as a, as a weapon of population control against colonized and oppressed peoples and prisons inside places like Abu Ghraib? You know? What's the relationship between prison as a weapon of gendered social control when the biggest fear that most white people have of going to prison inside this country is being raped when they go to prison. And these are men who never think about being raped when they're out in civil society, though there's not a woman in this room, I don't think, that hasn't taken precautions to prevent being raped herself. All this stuff ties together. I don't mean to be so eclectic, but I'm saying all these subjects tie together. You know what I mean? Partly I'm getting, it's getting late and I'm getting sort of rummy. What? Yes. Uh, Quick one, hopefully. Do you foresee the possibility of our troops largely leaving the theaters of combat in Iraq, yet remaining clustered within these permanent bases as a long-term sort of a thing? That's, 
That's what they want to do. That's what they want to do. But it's the funny thing about soldiers, they got to eat and drink and, you know, wash their clothes and all that stuff. And, and, and the, the, you know, this is the same problem they were confronted with in Vietnam when they tried to put bases there. You put a static base on the ground, you have to supply it. So that means you got to ride, you got to drive trucks to it, and you got to fly helicopters to it, you got to land planes going in there. There's no way to, to remain isolated in a situation like that indefinitely. You know, it just becomes unsustainable. I thought you were about to ask, do I foresee the, the troops rebelling? It's like one can only hope. I've got a quick one. Uh, yep, sure. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Why is uh, NATO still a guest in Afghanistan, and what can... I, I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. I couldn't hear you. Uh, why is NATO still a guest in Afghanistan, and what can be done, or why isn't more being done about the poppy farming there? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess NATO's there, I guess, to justify their existence. I don't know, because, I mean, it's a... I mean, NATO was designed, to, again, it was, a, you know, it was, a, it was a sort of enemy counterpart to the Warsaw Pact, and so I guess they've got to find some new role for themselves. Um, I don't know about the poppy farming. I mean, you know, heroin's pretty popular, and so I, I, I don't see that stopping anytime soon. A Afghanistan is sort of off everybody's radar because of Iraq. Um, I'm not seeing anything promising going on there right now. The Taliban's walking around in battalion-sized formations in the south of the country right now. It's like, you know, I make this joke that Hamid Karzai is the mayor of Kabul. And I'm not even sure that he's the mayor of the whole thing, uh, you know, because these warlords and whatnot have taken over everywhere. And, you know, they, I mean, it's the only economy that's there that I know of, you know, is our, our poppies. Uh, and a lot of people have a lot of interest in the money that generates. So it's, it's one of those hard things to, hard things to stop. But I... I just, I, I'm not very well informed on that one, I'm afraid. Okay. Got a question as a <clears throat> fellow paratrooper, too. Uh, do you think that civil rights uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan might improve as a latent function of uh, the war in Iraq and occupation in Iraq? I don't know. Um, I don't know what I mean by civil rights a lot of times, uh, because, y you know, you, you can only you can put civil rights in the context of a certain stage of historical development, too. Uh, um, I, I, I think it's certainly possible, but I don't think it's possible under a military occupation. Um, uh, if it does happen, it's going to happen as a consequence of a struggle that goes on internally. I mean, you know, people start uh, demanding. Uh, more autonomy and demand, demand more civil rights as part of their own internal political development and eventually they, you know, uh, can win those rights, but I don't think they can win it with an outside force like that, no. Uh, one last question about that, like a sort of the same uh, subject. Have you seen any improvement on many of the countries that you've been to and special operations in the United States has any sort of correlation <laughs> with that and improvements in those countries? <laughs> I, I went to eight conflict areas and, and it's, it's sort of a peculiar thing. Um, short answer is no. Uh, but, but, I mean, you know, you gave me the SAG and I'm going to use it. It's like, I mean, you did the same thing. I don't know if you re-enlisted, but I know you enlisted. Every time we raise our right hand, you know, what do we say? I, I, I do solemnly swear to protect the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. The Constitution. Now, I didn't say I was going to protect Halliburton. I, didn't say, I never said that once. Not once did I say I'm going to protect KBR. Now, it was, you know, exactly. Now, the, uh, when, when you realize that's the oath you took, I, hereby, I, I, I solemnly swear to protect the Constitution of the United States from all enemies, foreign and domestic. It's like in eight conflict areas, I never found a single person that was an enemy of the Constitution. <laughs> there nobody opposing the Constitution in Vietnam that I know of. You know, or Salvador, or Guatemala, Peru, Colombia, Somalia, Haiti. I, I, I just, I never, you know, Grenada had a lot of enemies of the Constitution down there. You know, uh, they were like waiting around, tearing them up in front of us. And the, <coughs> uh, uh, but, but uh, I, I, I have to be. I, I actually do see some domestic enemies of the Constitution running around loose right now, and they seem to be holding political office. 
So in a way, I may be fulfilling my oath right now for the first time, you know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.